what's going on across the pond? You know, in Europe, with the pandemic and the steroid jacked up president raging in his Republican lackeys tap dancing and lying, the media in this country has sort of forgot about UK's financial Harry Carry Act, known as Brexit, as well as what's going on in the European Union and how the EU is reacting to the dumpster fire raging across the United States. I'm here to correct that admission. Welcome to a special European Insights edition of Total Picture Media. I'm Peter Clayton. Today, my special guest is my good friend, Greg Robbins, based in Geneva, Switzerland. Greg is the founder of Robbins Advising, a wealth management consultancy, advising his clients on how to deal with the most complex problems and situations that they face in the management of their personal wealth and their business interests. His career in financial services has included leadership roles in banks such as Citigroup, UBP, and UBS. Greg received his BA in economics at Rice University. He was awarded a Marshall Scholarship and received his master's and doctor's degrees at Oxford University with a specialty in finance and a geopolitical focus on Russia and Eastern Europe. Greg has taught and lectured in leading business schools, including the executive MBA programs of the NYU Stern School of Business and the New Economic School in Moscow. Greg is a longtime resident of Switzerland with years lived in the United Kingdom and Russia. He is fluent in Russian, Spanish, and French, and joins us today from his home in Geneva. Oh, well, Greg, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. Uh, you and I have been good friends now for uh, over two decades, started back in late 90s when we were doing all of this work for City around uh, Y2K and uh, the European Union. That's when it was City Bank, huh? That's when it was City Bank. Before City Group. So that really yeah. dates it. Yeah. yeah, that really dates us. But those were fun times, traveling oh, all great, over Europe. Great times. Yeah. Um, so you are now in Geneva. You uh, deal in wealth management. And I really wanted to get uh, some sense from you from here in the States on what's happening in Europe uh, with the business, with the economy, mm -hmm with COVID. Yeah. So give us a, give us an update. Okay. Well, thanks, Peter. Look, it's great to visit with you. It's always, always a treat. And uh, I'm happy to try to shed some light on a few things. I mean, look, the situation in Europe is, how should we say, it's firstly, it's diverse. So there's not one Europe in terms of what's going on. Countries are dealing with this differently. Just as in the U.S., you can't generalize. Some states, some areas of the country are having different experiences. They're in different phases of, of what's going on. But Europe, I mean, start with the positive things. I think Europe has handled this crisis pretty well. Um, Certainly in a better sense than that, the United States. Uh, yeah, I think there's probably certain measures one would say have been, have been better for sure. But if you look at some of the positives, one, you know, Europe came together, um, which was really a major effort to provide funding um, to member states, you know, so richer states contributed poor and to help states that were struggling a bit more. Um, and these were not loans. These were grants to, to these states. Uh, and that was pretty, pretty remarkable. You know, it reminded me a little bit in scale to what happened in the U.S. after 2008 when the, when the financial system was melting down. There was really a kind of bipartisan uh, and in this case kind of binational effort to do the right thing. It, it wasn't an easy process here. You know, you had some countries, notably the Netherlands and, and certain Germany, objecting um, because obviously they were net providers and some countries were benefiting more. Uh, but in the end, it got done. A uh, little kind of ironic footnote, which is Italy, which benefited probably the most and got between 30 and 40 percent of the grant, you know, at the same time saw a rise in a party advocating a get out of Europe stance and a kind of anti-Europe stance. So I thought that was kind of a strange uh, ir irony. But nevertheless, that was very positive. I think the ECB, you know, the European Central Bank has done a good job, as has the Fed, frankly. Uh, I think central banks have done the best that they can do in this process, which at the end of the day is not really about central banks. So 2008 was about central banks because the financial system was in disarray. There were some, there, there some confidence issues. There were credit issues. There were liquidity issues. 
Central banks are really good at that. And at the time, they had ammunition because interest rates were higher. Today, fast forward, um, they've done what they can. Interest rates are pretty much at the, at the bottom. Um, and this isn't an issue about credit and liquidity. It's an issue about the real sector. It's about people having uh, funds to be able to consume and to, and to invest in certain things. And so this is really a matter for fiscal policy because this has not been caused by imbalances, it's been caused by a microscopic virus that has decimated all these economies. And so um, the important thing has been the, the fiscal measures, which is why it is so incredibly difficult to watch what's going on in the States with the stimulus package, because this is the one hope to actually help things, because the central bank can't do it. And you know, Powell has talked about this. The central bank is, is all but pleading with the government to do something. And in Europe, that has worked better, I think, because it also has worked at the the state, uh, the, sorry, the national levels in Europe, and it's worked at the pan-European levels. So in that sense, it's been a good story. You know, this, the U.S. again is different for people listening in the U.S. States in the U.S. don't have the ability to run deficits, right? So so they can't, they don't have a fiscal policy per se. So they need really the federal government. So it amplifies the stimulus problems because the states are so, uh, you know, kind of uh, constrained in what they can do. Um, but 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 I, I digress a little bit. So going back to Europe, so that's been the kind of pan-European picture, and I think by and large it's worked pretty well. Then there's the national picture, you know, and the countries have been going through different experiences and different phases. You know, Italy first suffered, Spain had some very difficult times, France, uh, it calmed down, it's spiking again. You know, Spain is back in trouble, France is in trouble. Switzerland, thankfully, where I'm sitting in Geneva, has done on balance pretty well, um, but we're in the middle of it. So, you know, we have to be careful. Um, and so the Swiss maintain a very rigorous uh, watch list of countries where if you go there, you have to come back and quarantine. Uh, we did that in the summer. We went to Spain. We came back and voluntarily quarantined, and, and we were fine. But but that's the way uh, it's been done. So I think in general, um, I think you know the the so-called better angels of our nature have come out in a lot of cases in Europe. It's been heartening um, to see uh, good behavior. You know, cooperation. Um, and, and, you know, relatively little uh, kind of xenophobia. Uh, it always exists, but, but I think it's been managed uh, pretty well. The economies, you know, look, I think worldwide, with certain exceptions in Asia, where economies have managed somehow to, you know, isolate these cases and continue to stay open for business, um, Europe has, like the U.S., had to, to really constrain a lot of economic activity. Uh, they've done a pretty good job, I think, here of, you know, keeping people uh, with funds to be able to uh, persist and subsist, you know, as uh, kind of demand needs to catch up. And, you know, the same, I mean, some of the issues are very similar. You know, the, 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 the tourism sector has been decimated here. Uh, and some countries, you know, usually depend on that. I mean, France, I think, was it has been the number one tourist destination in the world, and that's not been the case. I mean, we were in France over the summer driving through Provence, which is lovely, and to be there in July and have empty roads, uh, you know, was a nice silver lining, but of course sad for, for the country because there's a lot of lost business and lost revenue, and obviously the restaurants and all of the uh, affiliated businesses with, with, with travel. So I think, I think that's kind of the picture here. We're cautiously optimistic that it can continue to be, you know, managed, uh, as best as possible. Of course, the UK is, you know, when we talk about Europe, uh, the UK is still part of Europe for the moment, although that's not likely to last very long, but the UK has had a different experience and it's been a very trying experience. Uh, you know, COVID has obviously been a, been a major, major problem. It has not been contained. Um, it is spiking now, um, you know, which is personally for me quite difficult. I have a daughter in, in, in veterinary school in London, and I haven't been able to see her for some time. So it is a tough situation there. Um, 
and it's not clear you know how easily it gets resolved and it's obviously happening right at the moment where brexit is coming to a head so it's kind of to my mind it's kind of a perfect storm right now um you know for boris johnson and for that government and you know um i imagine a lot of your listeners are wondering uh what's happening with brexit and when is it going to happen at all and if i knew the answer to that uh I'd be very happy, but I, I don't. Uh, and I don't think anyone does. And I don't think Boris Johnson knows. Uh, it is looking more likely that there will be no deal. Um, it's looking more likely like we will get to the end of the year and the UK will, will have to uh, exit without a deal, which would have tremendous negative economic effects on the UK, some on Europe, but much more on the UK. Um, and I think it would create a rather precarious situation because one of the one of the ideas in the UK was to align with the US, um, you know, and in talks with the Trump administration, this idea of some massive uh, trade deal, which I think was overblown and unlikely to happen anyway. And I don't think that I think the devil will be in the details when they get into agriculture policy and healthcare and all. They're going to find a lot of things they don't like. And I think they're going to have less options, right? Because if they if they if they do leave Europe and they have to find another kind of major trading partner, uh, they're going to be at a disadvantage. And then, of course, there is the U.S. election. So in the end, they might not be dealing with, and, and hopefully, they will not be dealing with the Trump administration. Thank God. Um, going going forward. <laughs> yeah, let's hope. So I hope that I, that's oh a long. God. That's a long discussion, Peter. But I hope it's helpful to people listening. That's there is that scene in Thelma and Louise where they drive the car off the cliff, right? Yep. And that's to me that seems to be pretty a, a good representation of what the UK is doing with Brexit. Um, actually, it's, a, it's actually, it's actually, it's a very good one. I mean, look, I, I was never a fan of Brexit. I always thought, you know, it's, it doesn't fit the view I had, which was, you know, that there was more to be gained by, by inner, you know, integration with the EU. Um, and that's been largely borne out. I mean, there's no question that the costs have outweighed the benefits. I mean, if you, if you have an intangible benefit of that, some portion of the population had this great desire to, to be free. Um, well, okay, but um, the, the, clearly there have been reasons to backtrack. And as you said, you know, the car has been heading towards a cliff and nobody, um, and of course, least of all Boris Johnson, was willing to stop and say, wait a minute, why don't we stop, reassess this and see if there's a better way? And, you know, there was some idea that they could kind of have their cake and eat it too, that they could leave, but, you know, cut a, a very sweet, deal uh, and that wasn't going to happen um and so i think you know it's been very frustrating to watch this for years you know kind of not get there you know one of the 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 commentators you know the the economist that i follow is a guy called paul donovan who's at ubs and used to actually be a colleague very bright guy and i really enjoy his updates and he always refers to brexit as the interminably tedious process of brexit and you know, and he's right, you know, it's just it. And probably what will happen is something will get resolved at the very, very last minute. I mean, EU things tend to happen like that anyway. Mm -hmm. They tend to drag and then get resolved in a crisis moment, uh, unlike the US, right, where there's forward planning and, you know, agreements and there's never a midnight deadline to, yeah, to right. balance the budget or something like that. And I'm, of course, I'm being facetious, but uh, this is this is the picture. Yeah, someone on uh, Twitter wrote, Canada is this very nice, friendly country living on top of a meth lab. And I think that's a very good description <laughs> of what the hell's going on in the United States. It's, um, it's, it's, very it's crazy. I mean, the whole thing about, you know, face masks being politicized. Is that happening in Europe? No. No. No, not to the same extent. No. No, you know, we were in Spain for a week. Uh, there you had to wear masks all day, every day, everywhere. No respite. Uh, and people did it, you know, and, 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 and people did it. Um, how a face mask at this point in time, 
you know, that is so demonstrably clearly beneficial and protective could be seen as anything but that uh, is beyond me. But, you know, I think I think one of the unforeseen consequences or unintended consequences of, of, of COVID, you know, it's an interesting uh, topic. I spoke on this on some podcasts some months ago. And, you know, the worry was that it would bring out the worst in human nature and politics and that countries would, and it, and it happened in the beginning. Countries were competing with each other. They were hoarding supplies. They were trying to cut off distribution of key supplies, right, of health uh, treatments and all kinds of things. And the worry was that that would just exacerbate. And to a certain extent it has, right? Uh, and, and carry over to vaccines and things like that. And maybe it will happen. I mean, when there are vaccines, which clearly will come and clearly will not be ready for full global distribution on day one, there will have to be some sense of how do you distribute it and where are the priorities? And at that point you can you can guarantee there will be a lot of politics involved. The other thing, though, that's happened is uh, politics has driven misinformation in a way that I didn't anticipate, you know, and and we're seeing that clearly, you know, the U.S., unfortunately, is kind of the poster child for this now. You can't trust anything that's coming out. It's being manipulated, um, you know, from treatment efficacy to vaccine timing and vaccine, Um, you know, uh, Russia announced a vaccine which clearly people were skeptical of. And so I think to add to, you know, the complications around this pandemic where what we need really is global transparency, global collaboration, cooperation, and global efforts to, to, to deal with this kind of, you know, existential threat. Instead, what's happening is the politicization of it um, and misinformation and manipulation. And, and it, it starts with, as you talk about masks, but it's all through the drugs. And I think that's very worrisome because people will not know what to believe and what not to believe. And that will not help matters. And so when you have people in the US like Fauci and others who have no agenda, right. who are you know incredibly qualified at what they do, not being listened to and not being the clear voice you know, and places like the CDC being tampered with and having interventions. And it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous, you know. And uh, so I think the, the, you know, the world needs to find a better way forward, you know, post pandemic, because there will be other, you know, potential pandemics at, at managing this process. Maybe it's, you know, by reconstituting the WHO and fortifying the WHO, but you need scientific, uh, input and oversight on the right level and with the right resources and with the right authority. And then you can do something. And if not, you, you run the risk that it becomes a political football, which is what's happened. So you brought up Russia. You are an expert in Russia. You've lived in Moscow. You speak the language fluently. Um, uh, again, you've worked and lived there. Uh, what's happening with Russia right now vis-a-vis Europe? Uh, you know, I, I was asked this question, uh, in fact, just the other day on, on a podcast to contrast Russia, you know, from 15 years ago, because I did something there 15 years ago. And I said, look, uh, in general terms, Russia is a much more isolated place than it was a decade ago. And I would say today, Russia is very isolated, right? So when you say these are the Europe, uh, the U.S. is a different situation because there's a whole election issue. Um, the issue of Navalny, you know, the opposition leader's poisoning has really increased the temperature um, in Europe. And there's a lot of talk of, of sanctions and other things that might come from that. In fact, the EU would have levied sanctions, but the EU relies on um, unanimous consent amongst all, tw- all 27 members. And Cyprus actually was able to stop it for reasons having absolutely nothing to do with the, with the issue. is about a, an issue in Turkey, but they used that as a leverage point and stopped the sanctions process. Uh, that, that was around Belarus, but, but nevertheless, it's kind, of, it's kind of related. So I think Russia is quite isolated uh, politically um, and also economically at the moment. You know, the sanctions that came into effect in 2014 with Ukraine and Crimea have had a had an impact. And so the access to international markets, Russia used to do a lot of IPOs, that hasn't happened. And so I think Russia has become much more insular. Um, and 
dealing obviously as well with COVID as, as every country is, and Russia has had its, its issues with that, and, um, you know, and tried to manage it. And, you know, they're, they're doing at times well, at times less well with that, but it's, it's an issue and there is a, there is a pandemic going on there. And so, you know, that's kind of the situation. I think Putin is in a difficult place at the moment because, you know, Belarus, um, you know, has its problems around Lukashenko and he has certain choices to make there of the, being, you know, supportive and facing, you know, criticism and potentially sanctions for that or not and allowing, you know, uh, you know, kind of opposition riot, you know, uh, protests and things to rise up. Um, so I think, I think it's, it, it, you know, Russia's in a tough uh, place at the moment. You know, and I think they're they're waiting to see what happens with the U.S. election, um, which is unlikely to make a big difference. I don't think with with U.S. Russia relations. Um, you know, I think those are you know pretty soured for the moment. And even even if uh, Biden or when Biden becomes president, it will not turn the system. Uh, Russia, there's a lot of catch up to do because of some of the things that have been at least alleged and, and, and proven in a U.S. context around the election meddling. So I think, you know, Russia, uh, for the moment, as I say, is quite insulated uh, and isolated um, and may pivot more towards China and to other places because the U.S. is kind of quite distant. Europe is, is somewhat problematic at the moment. Uh, and it's ironic because, um, you know, November of last year, I was in Moscow at a big investment conference and there was a lot of optimism that the European sanctions would come off this year. There were signs that, you know, Putin was participating in discussions um, around Ukraine and finding, you know, kind of a peace agreement, you know, kind of following kind of the Minsk agreements and all to, to kind of settle that situation to enable European sanctions to come off. There was no expectation on U.S. sanctions, but certainly European sanctions. And so, you know, now we're back to a place where that's kind of been reversed a bit. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's, that's what I would say, you know, um, hmm. you know, just quite and quite an isolated, um, um, position. How healthy is the European union right now? I know that there was some impact with Brexit. Um, so what's going on with the EU countries? Well, as I said earlier, you know, um, you know, and, and I'm not, uh, an expert per se on the EU, or I, I don't have my ear to the ground in Brussels, so I can't comment in, as, a, as an expert on that. But as I said, they did come together um, and put together a massive uh, aid package to help their weakest members. Um, there hasn't been fragmentation. There's not, you know, clear talk of, of countries leaving. I think, you know, I think, uh, frankly, Brexit has been a bit of a uh, a warning bell, because uh, you know it hasn't exactly been a smooth process for the UK yeah, to, no to, eg to exit, <laughs> right? So, um, in that sense, I think uh, I think the EU at the moment uh, has has done pretty well. You know, I mean, EU bashing is is you know come is always in fashion, and people can be critical of the EU and the lack of decisions. I, what I told you about Belarus, you know, right. this idea that sanctions were you know held up by by Cyprus, uh, but you know that's just in the way it's in in the way it's constructed. I think you know your question will be interesting to revisit in a few months when Brexit you know happens or doesn't happen, right? Um, or and the or election happen, in the but, U.S. is over too, I think, because that, yeah. that, that has to have some impact on, um, what's happening in the UK and what's happening in, in the rest of the U, uh, EU. Yeah. Look, I mean, if we talk about the U S for, for a moment, um, you know, whether, whether or not you think if you're sitting today in the U S and whoever's listening, whether you think this America first or whatever, uh, whatever you think that policy is about, Right, but but isolating America and putting America's interests first, and, and and downplaying alliances and stuff like that. Whether you think that's good for America, and I don't think it is good for America. I also don't think it's been a clear America first policy. I think it's been a Trump first policy, but uh, it's clearly not been good for the rest of the world. Um, that relies on America as a as a leader, as a moral leader, as an authoritative 
leader as a you know um and 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 no more problematic has it been than in europe you know where there's long-standing alliances with germany with france with the uk with, um and so you know i think there's a lot of there has been a lot of shock and astonishment uh, over here you know i can talk about about europe and the interactions i have um over the first years of this administration has been a lot of kind of dismay and, and dis disbelief at how this could be happening. Um, and then in this year with COVID, I mean, the one word that I would say summarizes how people think about the U.S. is, is pity. There is tremendous pity to see a country on its knees, um, you know, suffering the way it is. You know, it's just almost unthinkable, you know, that you have, you know, 4% of the world's population and 20 plus percent of the world's deaths, and clearly a situation that's not managed. Um, so there's a lot of pity, you know, there's, you know, just a simple things, you know, a US passport today gets you nowhere. That's right. You, know, you can't, you can't go anywhere. You know, uh, you mentioned, I, I do advise, you know, wealthy individuals and families, and, you know, one of the conversations at times is around passports and residence and other places. And it's quite an interesting thing because one of the ways, and, and there's a whole market worldwide for this, there's Caribbean passports that people buy, there's European passports, there's all sorts of things. And one of the measures when you assess, you know, is it worth having this passport or that passport is how many countries does it get me into without a visa, right? So access, right? That's one, not always the main reason, but today, the U.S. passport doesn't get you anywhere. You can't come to Europe. You know, there's a bunch of other countries you can't get to. And so that is quite a, a statement, you know, and it's affected a lot of people. It's affected me personally, you know, uh, in, in my family. People can't travel. And, and so, you know, I think it is, you know, kind of symbolic of, of what is going on. You know, there's, there's a real sense of pity and sadness for what, has befallen the U.S. this year. Um, and the hope is, of course, that, you know, there can be a kind of rebirth with an election with, you know, some progress on COVID and vaccines and some kind of renewal. Um, but it's been a very difficult period. Uh, as an American abroad, um, it has been very tough, you know, and, and anecdotally, um, you know, I do have friends within the, the, the you know, the, the, the government, let's just say, I don't want to be too specific here, but that work within kind of governmental uh, areas abroad. And it's clear if you talk to them or I talk to foreign diplomats that I know that, that the kind of soft power of the U.S. is so greatly diminished, you know, so greatly diminished. You know, the voice of the U.S. has been softened, you know, and muted somewhat because, you know, you can't uh, there's 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 very little um, there's very little kind of rationality and, and proper development of policy. And then, of course, you know, everybody knows that you could spend a long time developing a plan or a project or a policy. And in one tweet, it could all be over. And so that doesn't, you know, create an environment of trust um, and commitment um, that you need. And so, you know, and look, for people that are very interested in this, uh, I read recently in, in foreign policy, Richard Haas, who's the, who's the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote an excellent piece about the real global picture of the U.S. isolationism and what it means and you know, what it would mean if there was somehow another four years and more continuity of that. And Richard Haas, of course, is nonpartisan. You know, mm -hmm. he's, he, he clearly he clearly has strong views against what's going on now, but they're not partisan political views. They're, they're academic, you know, kind of policy-oriented views. So I, I pray that things get better. As an American who, you know, loves know. My, my country, um, I really pray that things can somehow improve. I've never seen things quite as, as bad as they are now. Uh, no kidding. I mean, we thought Bush was bad. Remember? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things. I mean, look, there are a lot of things that Bush did that turned out to be disastrous. 
right? Disastrous, right? right? right. Uh, Iraq being a big, the big example. But, you know, Bush was not an immoral man. You know, he, he was misguided, I mean, in many ways. But, but today we really have um, sunk to, to levels of, of pettiness um, and, and uh, you know, and, 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 and vigor in, in being, you know, difficult that I would have never, would have never guessed. You know, I just happened to watch uh, on an uplifting note because it is tiring to- It is to very tiring. Bemoan, you know, and the debate, you know, if the debate or so-called debate uh, of a week and a half ago was somehow one of the low points of my political life in terms of observing politics, it was just so difficult to, to watch. Uh, I just tuned in and hopefully the VP debate tonight will be better. Um, I watched Joe Biden give a speech at Gettysburg um, this week. And it was the most uplifting thing. And I say this not because I'm a Biden supporter, which I, which I am. Uh, his speech was not partisan. It was not a pro-Democrat speech. It was a pro-U.S. speech. And it was talking about overcoming division and, you know, finding kind of a common language. And I think I agree with what he said. I think we've reached a point of bitterness and partisanship that if the country doesn't find a way to deal with it, it will it will grow worse and it will be really become a place that's unmanageable. And you will have a system where, you know, if you have 51 votes, then the other 49 make no difference and have no voice, mm -hmm. right? And that's what's increasingly happening. And so party in control will do whatever they like. And, 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 and over the long term, that's not, that's not a way to, to run the country. So I encourage people to watch that. Not again, it's not a, there's not a Biden commercial. Uh, I hope people vote for Joe Biden, but it's not. But I, I just, it was very heartening to hear that sort of discourse in, in such a divided, conflictual uh, time. Well, I will definitely check that out because I, I have not watched that. You put know, it in your note, notes, please, because I think I people, will. Uh, I will. Watch. I, I, it's, I will it's put very put, uplifting. I'll put a link to it in my show please. notes. And, you know, Greg, I, I lived in New York City in the 80s, so I'm not surprised by Trump at all. Because, Nor am I. I, I did the but same. I am surprised that the entire Republican establishment has supported this guy. That that has surprised mm. me. Look, there. I agree with you. You know, I grew up in New York. I grew up in the Bronx. Very proud of it. Um, you know, th uh, you know. I think. I think if you look at Trump, I think you know the Apprentice was clearly what was the game changer, right? The, the Apprentice kind of brought an image which clearly is not been a, a, a valid image of, of who he really was, but it, it presented an, a, a kind of a, a prototype to the country that people liked, but we knew growing up that that wasn't exactly accurate. Um, and so I think that uh, I didn't expect this to happen. And we've been saying for years it wouldn't happen. Having said that, you know, there, there I mean, people that know the situation far better than I do. I read a, a, an excellent book by Ezra Klein, you know, Why Are We So Polarized? And he really does a good job of explaining how the country became so polarized and why this is happening. You know, why it is rational when you say Mitch McConnell, how could he do what he's doing? How could he, you know, do what he did to Merrick Garland? And how could he now do the same thing in reverse? And the answer is because he can. And for him, if you put principles aside, which he does, um, it's totally rational for him to do what he does. It's completely rational. It's, it's hypocritical. It's abhorrent in a lot of ways. Yeah, but it is rational. Um, another excellent article for people that really want to read this, Ann Applebaum, who's a terrific writer, uh, wrote something in The Atlantic uh, something about uh, the collaborators. I think it was called the collaborators. Excellent article. People should. And she, in that article, uh, looked at exactly the question you're posing, which is why would these people, you know, kind of just stick to supporting 
this person of policies, even when they see some of the downside, even when they opposed it, and even when they condemned it. Um, and I mean, the short version is, you know, she has a few different reasons. You know, one is that people just are cling to power and are terrified at the idea of not having power. You know, the idea that somehow that they would not be in the, cir- in the inner circle and that they would be at home and the phone wouldn't ring, which is something a lot of people fear, right? Business leaders that leave, it's, it's that phone not ringing, right? It's really traumatic. So one, th- th- they're afraid to be cast out. Two, they're just afraid that he's going to send a tweet to 90, you know, 80, 90 million people, whatever he does, and they're going to have a new nickname and their life is going to get, you know, be, be muddied and they're going to be overwhelmed with hate mail and so on. And they'd rather not do that, right? So they don't speak out. Um, the third thing is some of them truly believe in some court sort of crazy messianic way, you know, and this is Barr, uh, this is Pompeo, this is that somehow Trump, and, and by the way, what I'm doing now is saying what, what Applebaum argued, this is not formulated by me, although I tend to think it makes a lot of sense, you know, that there's this messianic view that Trump has been put here almost, you know, by the almighty to make the country go in the right direction and, and assert, you know, the right kind of cultural values and obviously conservative kind of evangelical values. Um, and so, you know, and Barr is a, you know, a striking example of that who, you know, has long ago lost any sense of independence um, and some could argue kind of morality, right? Right. So those are some things I would suggest people read because it's something we've all been kind of dumbfounded by. Um, Although it does seem of late that the support has come down. I mean, everything I read uh, since the debate and since, you know, this latest uh, thing with COVID and and his actions and getting COVID and talking about COVID, it does seem like there is a break from what has been a consistent Biden lead to a, a very significant Biden lead. So it seems somehow he has lost some support. Um, that seems to be the case. And I don't, I, don't, I don't see him making any efforts, frankly, to not have that be the case. You know, whatever you thought of the debate, I don't see how that was pitched at people that were kind of trying to make up their minds, you know, that were going to say, hey, this guy sounded all right, you know. Um, anyway, let's not digress too much into yes, exactly. being politi- political hacks here, but it's nice to at least offer a few thoughts from very far away. Well, I really appreciate the thoughts that you have offered us today and the oh, insights sure. and perspectives. And, but I would like to end on uh, a positive note. Thank um, you. And that is, you have written a book that I know you're quite proud of. Um, we <laughs> talked about this offline. So would you please tell us, tell the audience about the, the wonderful children's book you have just published. Oh, well, thank you, Peter. I am so delighted to it. I'm happy to stop talking about all that other stuff. So I happen to have a copy here because I was just showing you. So this is a book called Silencio, Sound the Alarm. And it is a, it's a, it's a sweet story about an alarm clock uh, that is made without a con- with a conscience. And so uh, the fact that this alarm clock has a conscience is a fatal flaw for an alarm clock because he can't wake anybody up. And so it is the journey he goes through and his clock family, and there's all different characters. The, the illustrator, I have to say, her name is Charity Russell. She's based in the UK. She's extraordinary. And she brought this to life in just a wonderful way. And Silencio, you know, has his conscience and empathy. Um, and those things in the end, and I don't want to, you know, give away the story, turn out to be actually advantages for him. And so it's a book about how, you know, uh, quiet people among us and people that are sensitive and have conscience and so on can become heroes in their own way. And it's told through the story of these, these lovely little clocks and their, their, their family. So it, uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's written for six to 10 year olds. Uh, you know, and the language, I hope people will enjoy. It's meant to be funny. There's some plays on words. It's, uh, I think, you know, the adults that have read it have, have enjoyed it. Uh, and so I would, you know, 
love to, to know people might read it and have a look. If nothing else, as I say, the, the illustrations are super. That's great. And congratulations. I, um, thank you. I can't wait to read it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Well, again, thank you, Greg, for taking time to speak with me today here on Total it's Picture Media. Pleasure. It's uh, always great to catch up with you and to uh, see what's happening in the rest yeah. of the world. Yeah. You know? Look, anytime, it's t entirely my pleasure. Uh, anytime you, you know, want to, you know, get back in touch, uh, if, if particularly your listeners want more insights like these, uh, I'm always happy to, to provide what I can what I can share, you know, from my perspective and my knowledge base. Uh, I, I should end by saying, you know, I, I continue to follow closely and, and worry deeply about my, my homeland where I grew up and, you know, our dear country. Um, I hope, uh, one, everybody will be uh, healthy and safe, you know, and continue to be so. There might be more spikes and things, and especially in the winter. Uh, I hope that this election will happen, and I know it will be disruptive, but I hope that it will be handled as well as it can be. Um, and I obviously hope it will lead to a good result and a fresh, uh, a fresh beginning, really, to get the U.S. back on track. That's my, my hope, so I should end there. Uh, I think that's a, a, a wonderful way to end, and, and I, uh, I share <laughs> your your feelings along the same lines because boy it's it's just you know it's like we've been in a plague for the last four yeah. years yeah. and uh no one knows when it's going to end and let's hope it ends soon amen yeah all right my friend thank you peter be, be well. well yeah say hello to your lovely wife for me with pleasure yeah she'll say hello back okay and uh Take good care. Huh? You too. Hey, it's Peter Clayton. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and Upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email peter at totalpicture.com and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you and thanks for tuning in.